Hi there. So this is a video for my talk, uh, tucking in and now the third word order for Athlet 27. What I'm talking about today is what happens in the syntax when a single head has more than one specifier. So it's now standard in the middle of this program to assume that heads can have multiple specifiers, uh, but there's still a question of what exactly is the relationship between these specifiers in terms of uh, their relative height. There's been a claim in the literature that if one of the specifiers on a head is a thematic specifier, then this thematic specifier will be the lowest of all the specifiers. This claim has been made in part based on data from Austin region, uh, specifically Burkowski and Richards discuss Tagalog data and argue that if voice P has more than one specifier, the external argument is lowest, and this is crucial to uh, an argument that they make about Tagalog syntax. In this presentation, I'll attempt to show that this claim is in fact incorrect. Um, it's at least possible for thematic specifiers to not be the lowest. A stronger version of this claim would be to say that thematic specifiers are always highest, but ultimately this would require more cross-linguistic comparisons. Uh, specifically, what I'll do is, is use a data from Cebuano to show that in at least one configuration, we want a thematic specifier to be uh, above rather than below uh, another specifier of the same head. The data I'll look at comes from the so-called nominative third word order. Uh, I'll der derive this word order using Takian of the subject below a thematic specifier. All right, so here's the way that I'll structure the presentation. Um, I'll start with some background on relevant aspects of syntactic theory to show, that, uh, to show why it's been argued that thematic specifiers are lowest. Uh, then I'll give an empirical picture of the new data I'll be bringing into the discussion on specifiers and tucking in, uh, namely the nom nominative third word order. Um, I'll discuss the previous analysis of it by Lisa Travis, uh, and then I'll give a new analysis, which will involve the subject tucking in below the external argument. The conclusion will be that thematic spe specifiers can um, have other specifiers below them. So as I explained, uh, the background for my presentation comes from work on what happens when a head has more than one specifier. Uh, Richard argues for what he calls tucking in, meaning uh, that after the first specifier is merged, uh, further specif specifiers go below it rather than above it. Um, the idea is that they merge as close to the head as possible rather than exiting, exiting the tree. So we end up with two rather than one, where the specifiers are numbered uh, by the order in which they merge to the head. Uh, there's a variety of evidence for this, but uh, one that's particularly easy to appreciate is the ordering of WH elements in languages that front multiple WH phrases overtly. Uh, so three shows this for Bulgarian. Um, the idea is that in the question who sees whom, locality considerations dictate that the subject should be the first to move to spec CP, uh, but when the object moves to spec CP, it, it actually ends up appearing linearly to the right of the subject. So Richards analyzes this as the object moving as close to the head as possible, and therefore tucking in below the subject WH phrase. But notice that three is an example where both the specifiers are similar elements moving for the same reason. So it raises the uh, question about what will happen in more asymmetrical cases. Now, there's some discussion of this in, in the literature about cases where the specifiers move to check different features. But what I want to uh, focus on uh, today is cases where one of the specifiers is externally merged rather than internally merged. Uh, in other words, one of the specifiers is a thematic specifier. Uh, Rakowski has argued that in such a configuration, the thematic specifier will necessarily be the one closest to the head. Uh, Martha McGuinness uh, has also argued this, but I'll focus on Murkowski's argument. Uh, she makes the case for uh, that this is predicted by syntactic theory based on two assumptions. So first she argues, uh, she adopts Chomsky's immediate agree principle, uh, which says that agree always occurs as soon as possible. And for her, this means specifically that when a head is merged with its complement, it will agree with whatever is in its complement before the derivation moves on to externally merging anything else. So for example, if little v or voice agrees with the direct object, uh, then it does, it, it does this before the external argument is externally merged. Um, and then the second assumption that Rakowski uh, makes about syntax is that tucking in is universal, so it always takes place. Specifiers are always created right above the head rather than above pre-existing specifiers, and this is not something that varies by language or by head or by the feature being checked or anything else. So taken together, what these assumptions mean is that if something internally merges to the spec of a head, it will do so before another DP is externally merged. And when this other DP is externally merged, it will tuck in below the first specifier. So thematic, meaning externally merged specifiers are always the lowest. So this process is shown in four and five. So agree first takes place. Uh, and then uh, this is followed by the tucked in external merge of the thematic specifier. Both Rakowski in her dissertation and Rakowski and Richards in an article end up relying on this idea that thematic specifiers are always lowest in their discussion of Tagalog. Specifically, they use it to capture extraction facts in Tagalog. Uh, they discuss subjects, uh, meaning the pivot or topic, uh, in Tagalog as a form of object shift. 
when the subject moves its back little VP, um, it's assigned a specific interpretation, just like Germanic object shift, uh, capturing the generalization that subjects in the Tagalog must be specific. Uh, this quote unquote uh, object shift results in a construction where both the external argument and the subject are in spec little VP. Uh, so just to see an example of how this works, uh, consider the patient voice example uh, in six, uh, where the internal argument here in bold is prone to the subject position. Rukowski and Richards gives the, give the tree in seven, uh, which looks exactly like what we just saw in the abstract. The internal argument uh, moves to spec little VP and afterwards the external argument is externally merged, so it texted in below. Um, the reason that Rukowski and Richards rely on this configuration is to explain um, not word order facts, but rather the well-known extraction restriction in uh, Tagalog, uh, so only, uh, which states that only the subject can be extracted from clauses as shown in eight with relative clauses. Uh, Rukowski and Richards want to explain this uh, with an, the notion of, of locality. Their idea is that the two specifiers on little v are not equidistant, but are structurally at different heights. Um, and since the subject is above the external argument, um, it's the most local to higher probes, so the only one that can uh, be targeted by them. All right, so just to recap what we've seen, uh, there's a claim in the literature that externally merged specifiers will always be lower than internally merged ones, and the evidence for this comes from extraction facts in Tagalog. Uh, but let me emphasize uh, that it, it doesn't come from word order facts. Um, and I have a footnote here actually about uh, an argument that uh, McGuinness makes uh, based on data from Objective and Icelandic, um, which she takes to constitute word order evidence uh, that thematic specifiers are lowest. Um, so here the, uh, the, the object is, is to the left of the external argument. Um, but uh, Chomsky argues that in fact, um, this involves leftward movement of the object uh, beyond the phase edge. So if, if Chomsky is right, then this doesn't serve as evidence of the relative height of the external argument and the shift uh, object in spec little VP. Okay, um, so let's now turn to um, a set of empirical data that I think is important for the claims that we just saw about tucking in. Uh, I'll first describe the data, then in the next session I'll discuss the analysis that Lisa Travis provides for it, for it. Uh, then I'll turn to a new analysis I have um, and the consequences it has for tucking in. Uh, so the data come from so-called nominative third word order. Uh, this refers to the basic clausal word order um, for um, a number of languages, many of them spoken in the Philippines. In these languages, the clause of word order is that the subject follows a verb um, and the external argument in that order. Uh, of course, this is, uh, this is the case unless the subject is the external argument, in which case the subject comes in second. So this is schematized in 10, um, where XP stands in for all other phrases. Uh, there's a number of languages that display this word order, uh, as you can see here on the handout. Um, so it's a robust ph phenomenon that's been documented by a number of linguists working on a number of languages. Um, we can see this word order in 11, uh, which is from Cebuano. Uh, so the subject is in bold here and the external argument is underlined. Uh, so you can see the subject is second if it is the external argument, but otherwise it comes in third. Uh, at least for Cebuano, the word order is in fact relatively, uh, fairly free in the language. Uh, so nominative third is a preference or the quote unquote most natural word order. Uh, but it's not rigid. Um, however, I don't think that this is a problem for my idea of taking nom third uh, word order seriously as far as syntax is concerned. Uh, my assumption is that discourse configurational languages will have a basic word order with some sequent changes made to the basic word order for pragmatic reasons. So as syntax agents, we can and should ask what creates this basic word order. Um, a second point I wanna make um, is, is here is that I'll be comparing my analysis of nom third um, with what Rukowski and Richard say about Tagalog um, so it's worth noting right away that Tagalog is not a nominative third language. Um, studies on Tagalog have uh, word order have identified subject's positions as being clause final, unless it is the external argument. So final rather than third. Um, I've put on the handout both the principles identified by uh, Krager in his dissertation for word order in Tagalog. And I also note a recent overview article by Garcia and colleagues um, that agrees with Quaker and concludes that the basic word order in Tagalog is just what I said. So the subject is class final unless it's the external argument, in which case it surfaces in the external argument's usual position right of the verb. So let's assume that Tagalog is basically looks like, um, as I have here sketched out in 13, where the external argument is first on account of being the highest thematic specifier, and the subject is last because it's in some right branching specifier. Um, but um, as far as empirical evidence is concerned, uh, there's a big difference between Tagalog and nominative third languages. 
uh, which is that because a subject in Tagalog log branches to the right, it's harder to know uh, just how high it is. So it could be a right branching spec TP subject like it's drawn in 13, but for all we know from word order alone, there is nothing stopping it from being a right branching specifier at spec voice P, for example, or maybe some other phrase. Uh, in contrast to Tagalog, uh, nominative theory languages show very clearly that the subject is couched uh, between the external argument um, and all subsequent arguments. Uh, so we get a clear picture of what needs to be generated, and in a moment, this will lead me to making claims about nom third that wouldn't even be verifiable in Tagalog. So there's been two analyses of nom third that have been proposed in the literature. Uh, the first is by Peter Sells, and he proposes that nom third is a problem for binary branching since the subject is between the external argument and the rest of the theta domain. Uh, he proposes a flat clause structure, so the nom third border is basically stipulated. Um, I assume that binary branching is universal and that flat structure does not exist, so this analysis doesn't work. There's another analysis that Lisa proposes, uh, at least that Travis proposes. Um, she has a subject in a phrase uh, below what I'm calling voice P, the phrase that introduces the actual argument. Uh, so specifically, she uses the inner aspect phrase that she proposes in the book that I'm citing uh, here. So inner aspect, as, inner aspect P is an spectral projection within the articulation of voice P. Um, and so since uh, this aspect phrase is b uh, below little VP, this gets the word order where the subject is here below the external uh, argument, which is there, in spec little voice P. Um, so there's one important way in which I agree with Travis's analysis, which is that she has the external argument and it's based on a read position. Uh, she writes that she doesn't want to go with a possible al alternative analysis where the subject is in spec TP and the agent has moved even higher up. Uh, she says that this sort of movement would be unsupported by similar phenomena in other languages, and it would beg the question of why it's always the external argument that skips over the subject in this way to land in some higher position. And I think that's correct. Uh, so the EA is in its base uh, generated position, and so we have no choice but to put the subject somewhere within uh, what she calls little VP, what I'm calling voice B. Um, with that being said, I want to suggest three issues with Travis's analysis, um, the first two are of which um, are related, so it's a bit more like two issues in a sense. So the first issue is that um, this, this analysis is basically an, an ad hoc use of her inner aspect P uh, that's just meant to get the right word order facts. Um, so the issue is that in general, the specifier of inner aspect is meant to be a position for objects in telic sentences. The idea is that objects move into it and this delimits the lexical aspect and it makes sentences telic. Uh, to be sure, Travis does use this position for a handful of, of other things, including arguing that some arguments are base generated in that specifier. Um, but she does this for constructions in Malagasy that are marked for telicity, as far as telicity in Malagasy usually go, goes. So using the inner aspect P is justifying these constructions on the ground that telicity is at play or marked in some sense. Um, but this isn't the case with subjects in Cebuano. Uh, it's not like these interact with telicity in, in some way. As far as I know, they're, they're just normal Austronesian pivots. Uh, so the inner aspect phrase um, is too semantically loaded for it to be the cano canonical subject position. Um, this brings us to what I have here as the second issue, number two on the handout. Um, it's related to what I just said. Um, the idea is that, well, we could accommodate what I just criticized by saying, um, well, maybe the head is not really an inner aspect head, but is just some other projection that's below the external argument um, that's semantically vacuous. Um, so, so one that doesn't do anything other than hosting the subject. Um, so basically the idea here is that, just going back to this tree, uh, we could change this aspect phrase with something like a, a low uh, agar sp, for example, and say the subject is there. Um, but even then, there's still an issue here, um, it, 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 and it comes up when it's the external argument that, that's the subject. So remember that the external argument here is merged above agar sp, so when agar s is merged, there's no um, external argument in the sentence. Uh, but we, if we have a phrase like agar s that's dedicated to subjects, presumably it interacts with them in some way, like uh, agreeing with it, for example. But without introducing up, upwards agreement, uh, there'd be no way of having the agar s interact with the external uh, argument. So here too, even if we change our aspect phrase to a low agar s p, we run into the problem that we have to say that the head doesn't actually do anything, at least in the cases where the uh, subject is um, the external argument. Um, and then the third issue I want to suggest is that um, is a, a more conceptual issue. Uh, sorry, I, I, is a more empirical issue rather than the two conceptual issues I just identified. Um, so specifically, Travis's analysis makes it so that subjects um, that aren't the external argument um, are always properly below the external argument, meaning uh, they're below the external argument at every step of the derivation. 
uh, these subjects should therefore act in this way, uh, right? We shouldn't be able to bind into the HTML argument, for example. Uh, but this prediction isn't borne out. So 15, in 15, you have a patient voice sentence, every child is taught by their own father. And the external argument is their father, and the, the subject is every child. Um, but under uh, Travis's, uh, Travis's analysis, every child is always properly below their father. Um, so it shouldn't be able to bind uh, their father, contrary to the fact. Um, also for Travis, voice shouldn't really matter here because the external argument is always going to be higher than all of their arguments, no matter what the voice is. Uh, but in fact, uh, as we see in 16, uh, it does matter. Um, so in agent voice, every child is not only thematically low as, in, as, as the internal argument, um, but also it stays low since it isn't promoted to the subject position. Uh, and in fact, this sentence is less good. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to have an analysis of why 16 is less good than is only less good than 15 rather than being outright bad. Um, but I'll explain why 15 is fully acceptable, which for Travis's analysis is mysterious. Okay, so to recap what we've seen so far, the empirical data we're looking at involves sentences uh, where subjects surface apparently below external arguments. Um, I agree with Travis that the external argument is in its base position, so the subject two must be within voice p. Uh, but what I'm also claiming based on the conceptual issues and the empirical issue of binding is that the subject can't really be lower than the external argument. Okay, so to solve this, I propose that um, nom third actually comes from uh, tucking in of the subject just like voice p. This makes it land right below the external argument. Um, and here I'm using the term below descriptively. I assume that specifiers are in fact like predestined. Uh, so just, just to give an example sentence, consider 17, where the external argument Linda is distinct from the instrumental subject, the pencil, uh, which follows it. So this sentence looks like 18, uh, where the verb moves high to T, um, the additional argument is in spec voice P, and the subject text in below it. So this gives us the word order facts. Um, so we have a general, a general um, schematization of this in 19. So not only does this uh, analysis derive the non-third word order, but crucially, uh, nothing unusual needs to be said for cases where the additional, where the additional argument is the subject. Uh, since it's the same head that is involved with both subjecthood and uh, the introduction of the actual argument. So we're not going to be left with a head with no specifier or having to use upward agree or a head that leads to a particular semantic outcome when a specifier is, specifier is filled, um, as were my criticisms for Travis's analysis. Um, and finally, on the assumption that multiple specifiers of a single head are equidistant, uh, we can explain the binding facts I just discussed by saying that subjects can bind external arguments by virtue of these being equidistant. Uh, apparently good enough for the subject to bind it. Okay, so in this sense, my analysis fixes the issues um, identified with Travis's analysis, while also maintaining the idea that the external argument should be kept in its base position, which I said I agreed with Travis on. All right, so I'm spending a lot of time building up uh, this analysis, which is really a fairly simple analysis, uh, which is actually a nice thing about it. Um, but this is, this is just because the consequences are pretty surprising, uh, given what's been said in the literature about, about tucking in. Um, I started this presentation by laying out Rakowski's reasoning for why thematic specifiers should be lowest um, of, uh, of all of a head's uh, specifiers. Um, but what's crucial for my analysis of phenom third word order is that the additional argument is actually um, the voice P's highest specifier. So the conclusion to take from this is that it's at least not always the case that thematic specifiers are lowest. Um, whether this holds uh, all the time or only in some languages or some constructions, of course, is something that would require more work crossing linguistically. Uh, but it seems to me like the default hypothesis that in fact thematic specifiers are highest, not lowest. So to sum up, I've proposed a new account of nominative third word order uh, based on the subject tucking in below the external argument in spec voice p. Uh, my account is very similar to Rakowski and Richard's discussion of Tagalog subjects, but crucially in Cebuano and other non-third languages, we have word order evidence for the relative height of the specifiers, which we don't with Tagalog. Uh, the conclusion is that thematic specifiers aren't necessarily the lowest among their peers. In non third, they're in fact the higher of the two specifiers on voice. All right, thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Uh, let's thank our speaker. Um, so now the chat should be open, and if you have any questions for our speaker, please indicate so in the chat. All right, uh, we have a question from Micho. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hi, Matthew. This is, this is very interesting. So, um, but I had a couple questions. So, so one is the, the obvious one at the end. So I'm curious uh, if you do have 
thoughts about how you want to get the extraction restriction type of facts. And then the other is, it, insofar as, as you mentioned, in these languages, a nominative third is really a sort of preference or trend. Um, what are your thoughts about the other type of rearrangements? Like, what, what, how do you think about the postverbal scrambling? Well, for the extraction restriction, I think um, basically any analysis other than uh, the, the the phase based one uh, based on Rakowski and Richards would, would would do. So, so for example, the sort of li a case licensing licensing um, explanation that's that's uh, often given uh, nowadays, I think, would would work uh, equally as with with other analyses, um, I believe. Um, though I, I you know that's that's definitely worth spelling out. In, in detail, which I which I haven't done yet, um, but that's that's that seems like the best um, route to take for me. Um, you you mean a, of, you mean like a case discriminated probing, or is that what you had in mind? Maybe I don't uh, understand. Uh, well, just any analysis which is which is based on saying that the extraction restriction comes from um, issues having to do with licensing instead of. Instead of saying that it has to do with with um, you know only one thing being able to escape the phase, okay. Um, and uh, your other question was, do I have thoughts about how to get the other uh, word orders? Um, well, I, I mean, I think this is this is more of a, this is a very general question about how to get these non non uh, these discourse configurational languages to to do this. Um, so I guess the short answer is uh, nothing in particular. I think whether you want to do this. Um, using informational structural heads or some other kind of uh, scrambling or phonological reordering, um, in principle, that these should all, you know, these should all be compatible uh, with what I suggested. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, Yining has a question. If you could unmute yourself. Hi, thanks, Mathieu. Um, thanks. So I was wondering, I think I asked this question, a similar question to, to another speaker earlier. Um, so you rule out the uh, possibility of the nominative argument moving to a position below voice, right? So a, a specifier just below voice. Um, and I, I think because you thought it was conceptually stipulative, but given the fact that we might want to have something, a principle about thematic specifiers um, uh, tucking in, you would still need to say something, you know, in addition to um, what, uh, with the extraction restriction, et cetera, what people have proposed there. So why not say something stipulative about a projection that um, um, lower arguments move to that's just below voice? And that's like a dedicated, like focused or topic position that's low. Thanks. Hmm. Well, well, yes. Well, I think saying I would point you to the the, the second argument I, I try to give in my talk, which was that um, then you, you run to the issue of what happens when the topic is the external argument. Um, so if you have a dedicated topic position just uh, just below the external argument, then um, it, it's, it wouldn't be clear what to do in this particular case when the external argument is a subject because it's it's higher. Um, so you would either end up with the head with having no specifier, or you would have to have some strange upward agreement or something like that. Um, well, well perhaps I get, I, when when the um, external argument is the the pivot, um, you won't need that additional low um, topic or focus position because you know for some default reason. Um, so maybe yeah, it's okay to have to leave that position unfilled when there's nothing lower. That comes to up to saturate it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, suppose, I, I think you you could say that. I guess what I was I was trying to say that I would prefer not to, um, but I mean, obviously, like if you feel okay with that, then I, then I guess that doesn't rule out this uh, that possibility. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yes, Dan. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's a really interesting proposal. So I know this talk is not about Tagalog, but I have a question about Tagalog. 
um, which is that there's this generalization that, that holds there and probably in many other Philippine languages that the non-agent voice agent uh, really likes to follow the verb. So there's like a really strong preference to have the PV, LV, CV agent immediately after the verb. Um, and this, this is sort of like a nominative third pattern. Um, and I was wondering what you would say uh, to someone who would say, well, the reason for that is that verbs in these languages are nominalizations uh, and a patient voice verb is not really a patient voice verb, but it means something like cooked thing, right? So you're like, you know, a patient voice verb is, you know, like an X thing. And then the agent there is really a possessor. And the reason that you get nominative third order is because the agent is a possessor of like a thematic nominalization that means like, you know, an object nominalization. This is what Dan Kaufman has proposed. So I was wondering what you would say to someone who wanted to derive all nominative third orders from that sort of restriction. Thanks. Hmm. Well, I, I'm not I'm not familiar with that proposal, so I, I so I, it, it's hard to uh, to be sure that I'm going to do justice to it. Um, it. It does seem to make uh, these languages seem a little odd cross linguistically. Um, they seem it, it makes them seem a little, uh, you know, quote unquote exotic. Um, in ways that I think are pr preferable to to avoid. Um, so so that's what I would say without uh, having read that paper. But um, it, I, I I mean I suppose in terms of the word order that that would uh, after the word order of the um, external argument following the verb and having genitive case. Um, but but I, I suppose the idea would be that it would have to like the the verb initial it would have to be um, a, a phrase moving. Uh, to the initial position, um, which I, I suppose works, but then it, it, it feels like it would be a little hard to implement in terms of having the, the verb also be, you know, having morphological, you know, tense aspect stuff that seems a lot like verb movement to me, but yeah. thanks. All right, uh, we have another question from Micho. If that's okay, yeah, um, it, I just wanna, understand your proposal, Matthew. So the, um, where, where does nominative come from? And I guess, so in particular, I mean, if it's assigned structurally from a higher head or something, then in order to skip the agent, are you, are, does this proposal um, sort of implicitly uh, commit you to an ergative description of these languages? Yes, <laughs> so I thought, you, I thought you might ask that. So. Um, so this, the, the analysis does seem to be incompatible with um, the idea that the, the agent would have, um, would have uh, generative case as a default, um, because then both the subject and the agent would be in this weird equidistant thing and, and T or C or whatever head is giving case uh, wouldn't know what to do with them. Um, so I would have to say that um, the external argument is getting case from voice. Um, and so when, when T or C or CT looks down to assign case to the subject, um, it can skip over it and just sees the subject and gives it to that. Yeah. So, it's so like, yes, I'm committing myself to that. Yeah, it's an, it, it's I, an I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I'm committing myself to, to the idea that these are ergative languages. Uh, but it's, in, it's getting inherent none, yes. right? It's getting inherent yes. genitive or yeah, ergative or something, right? Yeah. Yes. So, so, so that very narrow, there, that like narrowly that claim, yes, I'm committing myself to that. Okay. Okay. All right. Good to know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, uh, Dan has another question. I hope this is okay. So building off of Mitchell's previous question and this discussion about inherent genitive ergative. So I wonder if we might not actually be able to, to think about a language like Cebuano as the fifth cell uh, in the, in the like, typology of Austronesian nominal licensing systems um, in the sense that we might imagine that non-pivot non agents have to be verb adjacent because they need to get case via adjacency with the verb. And this just happens to co-occur with the like insertion of a morphological, like a morphological genitive. So like there's licensing via adjacency and then somehow that co-occurs with insertion of a morpheme and you get the adjacency requirement that way. What do you think? Well, um, so, so the, I, I know there's some recent work on, I, 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 actually I would ask you, 
just if you can maybe clarify for me, do you know if the, the recent work on this um, requires ages, uh, adjacency to, to involve the uh, head or can it be a whole phrase? Because um, the subjects here can be entire phrases. And so I thought of this um, initially in terms of uh, saying, well, this doesn't look like like an Indonesian style adjacency requirement where, where you no, know, we're looking at something smaller than, a, than an NP or DP. Um, and so you can't do it that way. Um, but then actually now that you're asking this question on the spot, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember whether more recent work has said actually you can say this with entire phrases too. Um, so if one does say that, then, then uh, I wouldn't be able to rule it, rule it out just like that. Um, but certainly this doesn't look like a, a sort of, you know, with, with a, the, the passes or whatever in, in Malay Indonesian, uh, where we really need it to be smaller than, than NP. This isn't the case with non-third. 